Take me past the outer courts Through the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people The priests who sing their praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness But it only found in one place Take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me into the holy of holies Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take me past the outer courts, through the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people, the priests who sing their praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. But it's only found in one place. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the gold with my lips. Here I stand. So take me in. Holy of holies, take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take the cold, cleanse my lips. Here I am. It's time for you. So take me in to the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. So take me in to the Holy of Holies. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down. We worship you, Lord, Lord of all lords, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heavens before there was time, King of all kings, you will be. We bow down. We bow down and we crown you the king, king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king, we bow down and we crown you the king, we bow down and we crown you the king, king of all kings you will be. Good morning. Welcome to The Crossing. I hope you're doing well, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. I want to just encourage you right now not to be overwhelmed or, or to be too worried, but to remember that if you are a child of God, that your life is in His hands, so you don't need to be overcome with fear. Um, in just a moment, I, we're going to pray. Um, you know, you may have heard that uh, Ravi Zacharias, the great apologist and man of God, um, passed away from cancer this week, and he's gone on to his reward. And so I just want I'm thankful for men like Ravi Zacharias and, um, and the work that he has done in his life for the kingdom. And I want to um, 
I'm going to ask you to pray for his family, and I'm just thankful that he's enjoying his reward uh, in heaven. And let's, let's just uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to look at your word. And Lord, I pray that as we look in your word, that our hearts and minds would be open. Lord, that you would help us to lay down the distractions of this past week and that we would turn our eyes towards you, that we would fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we ask for courage. We ask for the ability to persevere and to keep on trusting in you. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we can worship you together again in large numbers. Lord, and I pray for every home, every family, every person that is watching uh, this message. Lord, that, that you would speak to them in these moments and that they would hear you and that they would draw near to you. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, there's a word that's used only once in the New Testament. And the word is Maranatha. And it means, Come, Lord. The Lord will come. Come, Lord, and judge. This became a catch word among the early church. And I'm told that believers would greet each other with this word, Maranatha, come Lord. Even in the early days of the church, they were focused on the second coming of the Lord. They were looking forward to it. As I mentioned last week in, in the message, there are literally hundreds of verses in, in the scriptures that, that specifically, clearly, plainly deal with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The early church was looking forward to his coming. Consider that, that their greeting in the mornings, in the marketplace, was, Come, Lord Jesus. Imagine if the coming of our Lord was the first thought on our, our mind in the morning and the last thought on our mind as we laid our heads down to sleep. One of my concerns is that the modern church, we have forgotten about the second coming of our Lord. It is not on the forefront of our mind. I wonder why. Is it because it seems like it's taken so long that that we have we've begun to doubt? Is it because we're so comfortable in our lives? When was the last time you thought about the second coming of our Lord? Last week I, I, I focused a lot on Matthew chapter 24 and, and the Lord's instructions to us, Jesus' instructions to us to watch out as we read how we might be prepared. And, and today I want to further look into how can you prepare for the second coming of the Lord? You know, you hear about preppers, right? People go by, go and buy, you know, 500 pounds of, uh, of oatmeal, right? Or, or whatever, um, to prepare for pandemics and things like that. Um, but how can we prep? You know, it's funny, out, out, in, the, uh, out in the garage, when, when this whole thing first started back in March, I ordered uh, 20 pounds of oatmeal um, off of Amazon. I thought, hey, it's dry, it'll last. You want to know how many pounds of oatmeal I have left in the garage in the bags right now? That's right, 20 pounds. <laughs> I was prepping. Didn't know what was going to happen. I was nervous. I was fearful. Probably like you are or were. But you know, um, what's even greater is that we be prepared for the second coming, and we can be. I was recently um, listening to a sermon by a great man of God named Dr. Dwight Pentecost, a longtime professor at D Dallas Baptist Theological Seminary. And he passed on a challenge to his hearers, one that was passed on to him by a revivalist before him named Barnhouse. And, and the challenge was this, to read the epistles in the New Testament, those letters written to the churches, the epistles are living letters written to the churches. The largest uh, portion of them written by the Apostle Paul. 
So he challenged uh, his hearer to, to his hearers, excuse me, to read these epistles and to notice what accompanies every passage of Scripture that refers to the second coming of our Lord. He instructed us that with every warning, with every call to prepare for the second coming of the Lord, you will find a call to holiness. So I set out to read all of the epistles this week. And you know what? He's right. Every time that we read about the second coming of our Lord and Savior in the scriptures, we find a call to godliness, to holiness. I want to talk about uh, just about a few of those things that I noticed to encourage you um, so that you will be ready, so that you don't need to be ashamed when the Lord returns. You can be prepared. We ought to be like the early church with, with the uh, second coming of our Lord on the forefront of our mind. We ought to be looking forward to it, not feeling dread because it's coming. That's a difference, I think, between that early church and us today. We want to be like the early church. I'm going to read to you a scripture from James chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Hebrews declares it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God in Hebrews 10, 31. And, and later on in the book of Hebrews 12, verse 29, we read that God is an all-consuming fire. Imagine the judge is at the door. What if the Lord were at your door right now? Are you ready for that? If the Lord, if you believe in your heart and mind that the Lord were at your door right now, what would change? What would be different in your mindset? What would be different in your action? What would be different in your purpose? Because Scripture, in many places, urges us to be prepared because the Lord's coming is near and it is closer than you think. The judge is at the door. There's no time to mess around. As we learned last week about the birth pains, the beginnings of sorrows, we can see that they are becoming more intense and closer together. It's time to wake up and get serious because the judge is at the, at the door. There are, there are three things that I want to share with you. Uh, so much um, um, I discovered as I was taking up that challenge. I would challenge you the same thing. This next week, uh, read all the epistles. I started with Rome, uh, Romans and read all the way through to the book of Revelation. Sanctify yourselves. One of the, th the themes that we find over and over and over again in the scriptures, especially when we read about the second coming of the Lord, is this concept of committing ourselves to the Lord in holiness and righteousness. 1 John 3, verses 2 through 3. But we know that when Christ appears, we, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. This is the most prevalent command in Scripture regarding the Lord's coming, to purify yourself, setting our minds on the things that are above, if you will, committing yourself to godliness, living righteously. We cannot save ourselves. We are saved by the power of the gospel. We are justified by the power of the gospel. We are being sanctified by the Lord, but there is a command in Scripture for us to commit ourselves to purity, to godliness. As the writer encourages us here, The Lord is coming, so purify yourself. The Lord is coming. Set your mind on the things that are above. The Lord is coming. Set your mind on godliness. The judge is at the door. If the Lord were to come back tonight, 
Are you ready? Or this morning, are you ready? Is there something that you need to add in to your life? Is there something you need to take out? Another, another phrase that, that, that comes up over and over again that just kept catching my attention as I read is the command to stand firm. And it's, it's said literally with the word stand firm, but it also shows up in other ways. Strengthen your hearts. Don't shrink back. Live by faith. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, we will be able to stand firm. All those elements of the full armor of God. As the day draws near, we need to stand firm on our faith. We need to stand firm on the Word of God, the promises of God's Word. We need to stand firm on the promise of the gospel. Maybe it'd be good to spend some time reading Ephesians chapter 6 this week. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians now, chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. Listen, I tell you mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe himself with uh, the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us this victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the word of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stand firm. Our government may tell us we cannot gather in large groups, but they cannot stop you from worshiping God. They cannot stop you from living in faith. They cannot stop you from worshiping. They cannot stop you from reading your scriptures and gathering with your family. Don't allow fear to drive you from your faith. Allow your faith to overcome your fear. Don't shrink back. Lean forward. Lean in. Stand firm. Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together as, as is the manner of some, but all the more as you see the day approaching. Worship the Lord together. Don't let the enemy shake your faith. Another one of the instructions we f I find um, over and over in reference to the epistles, their mentioning of the Lord's second coming, is to increase in love. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 through 13. Again, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Did you catch that? Let your love increase and overflow. You know, I hear stories of people from our church and even other churches, people doing kind deeds and helping others, calling people, checking on them, buying groceries for them, giving out of their own paychecks to help supply their needs, uh, the needs of others. Increase in love. When you feel the th threats and the fears and they press in, increase in love. Don't let the enemy distract you. And as the Lord is coming, draw nears. Let him come back and catch you loving others. Is there something that needs to change? 
The judge is at the door. Wives, how are you loving your husbands? Husbands, how are you loving your wives? Parents, how are you loving your children? Children, your parents, what kind of a friend are you to others? When we are afraid, when we, when we feel threatened, it's easy to pull inward and to isolate and to become selfish and to think of ourselves. A natural fleshly reaction. And I understand it and sometimes experience it. But we need to uh, listen to the word of, of, of the Lord here and allow our love to overflow and increase. Maybe spend some time praying. Spend some time reading, reading the word. Ask the Lord to help you. He'll guide you in how you can allow his love to overflow through you. Another theme that stands out to me, I, dec- I call it this. I describe it this way. Run to win. In the book of Hebrews, the writer uses the imagery of the race and the runner. And I love this. this in chapter 11, he, he begins to talk about the roll call of faith. Um, all of these believers who were martyred. He, he mentions uh, many of them by name. He talks about Abel who offered that sacrifice in faith, and Enoch, and and Noah, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and Rahab, and Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and David. He describes people who were beaten, who were killed, who were imprisoned for their faith. And he, and, and verse, um, chapter, verse 12, excuse me, in chapter 12, really stood out to me as I was reading this week. Again, that's Hebrews 12, verse 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy who set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, one of the things that I I have always really loved doing, especially um, when my older kids were younger, and that is going to high school football games. Um, One of my sons played high high school football, and I can remember sitting in the stands, and sitting up in the stands, I'm looking down uh, on the Hill High home side. Sorry for those of you who are from other schools. And, uh, and... It was just exciting. I, I, you know, I had a vested interest. A lot of those young uh, men out there who were playing, I, I'd known them for many, many years. And so when I would watch these games, it was like um, I rejoiced with all of them as they had success. I cheered them on and encouraged them. It was always exciting, especially when we played uh, when we played a rival like Glencoe, and and the stand was the stands were packed shoulder to shoulder. And whenever a great play was made, we would stand up and cheer. I, I remember uh, my son's last football game of his high school football career. Um, I believe one of the last plays he ever played, there was an attempted field goal that was fumbled. And he picked it up and he ran it all the way back down the field into the end zone. And I was jumping up and down and screaming. I think I lost my voice. He, they might, have well, might as well have won the Super Bowl that day. Do you have that imagery in your mind? Are, are you in the stands? Do you see the track down there? Imagine the runners. And you're, you're one of the runners, believer. And at the end of the race is the Lord, Jesus Christ. You're running toward Him. You're fixing your eyes on Him. And in the stands, it's not just the parents uh, of the players who are, who are cheering them on, but in the stands, it's... It, it, it's, it's men like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph 
and Mo Moses and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Samson and Jephthah and David and all those who were beaten and those who were killed and those who were imprisoned and they're shouting your name with every act of faith with every bold act of faith they jump from their seats and they cheer you on imagine that you are living your life out in plain view of these men and women who are now in the presence of God. L live. Live to win. Run to win. Live your faith. That passage of Scripture, it says in verse 12, Hebrews 12, where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, literally means since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of martyrs those who have suffered for their faith and did not relent. Do not relent. Keep your faith. Don't be distracted from the main thing. Live for Christ. Look toward the second coming. Pray for Him to come at night and in the morning. From now on, I can't wait to get back to greeting you in church, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say every time, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Are you ready? So listen, as I'm talking about Jesus coming, if you're feeling nervous and you're feeling a little bit sick in your stomach because you know you're not ready, you can get ready. The first and most important thing you can do to get ready is to receive the gospel message concerning Jesus. That is that Jesus is God's Son who is without sin, and He died on the cross to pay for your sins and mine, and He was buried, and on the third day He rose again. Scripture says if you'll confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, you'll be saved. And I just want to I want to pray with you right now and encourage you if, you, if you don't have that assurance, to pray with me. There is no reason to go on another day. Maybe as we've been reading the Word of God, the Lord is pulling on your heart, and it's time to say yes to Him. Pray with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, I know... Jesus, I know that you died for me. That you were that you were buried. And on the third day, you rose again. Jesus, you paid for my sins. You defeated death. I receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you offer to me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And believer, I pray that your heart will be stirred and your mind will be stirred to look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ because the judge is at the door. Lord bless you and keep you. Have a great day.
Yeah.